might help for you to do your homework, you can log on to this site and some volunteers will be available for you to, uh, to get help with whatever you need, basically. And for this, uh, we built uh, a, queue, a queue system and a chat system uh, where you can talk to some advisors. And originally we built this on Drupal 6 and it worked fine for a, for a while, but as we got more and more users, we were seeing in really intense load on the database. And I, I'd like to, to walk, walk through a, a bit of why. Oh, right, I'm supposed to speak into that now. Um, <laughs> there are some situations where, where PHP and the model its, its execution model is really not a, a good fit. Um, Drupal is slow. Um, that's hardly a, a controversial statement here. Uh, as anyone who, who's, been a, who's needed to have a large-scale Drupal site has known, there are performance challenging uh, aspects of all the nice stuff that Drupal does for you. Uh, it's not that Drupal is bad, it's just that all the advanced functionality you get from Drupal comes at, at a cost. Um, and, and PHP doesn't scale for, for, for certain things uh, because, and I'm going to go, uh, go a bit into uh, uh, like computer science lingo here, so, uh, but I'm going to try and to explain what it all means. But basically, PHP is synchronous, it is single-threaded, and it has a shared nothing uh, mode of operation. Um, and synchronous single threaded is like you could say the worst the worst of, of both both worlds. It is a very simple way to do things, but it also tends to eat a lot of server performance. Um, any modern computer is like a, a four way four lane highway. Uh, you can see each, each car is like something being done on the server, and it's it's not very. Uh, it's very common to see your, your, your highway looking something like, li like, like this. It's actually just, you know, standing around doing nothing. Uh, it's not really using all its capacity. Um, and the same goes for, uh, for PHP, actually. This is what you might see if you inspect what a PHP process is doing at any one time. Uh, the, blue, the, the, the dark blue areas is where PHP is actually doing anything, and all the other stuff is where PHP is not actually doing anything. Um, and, and it spends time, you know, waiting for databases, waiting for web services, waiting for, you know, waiting for the request to come from the Apache server. And all the while, it actually, the PHP process is running and it's eating your memory, doing nothing. Um, so the main thing that Node.js does is actually to, to try and fill in the spots where one part of your program is not doing anything uh, with uh, and allowing another part of your program to do something in the same time. So it's trying to use your resources more efficiently. And hopefully that all also means that your server will run faster. <coughs> this is a picture of, of another large web website we are running. Uh, this is what the server is spending its time on. And you can see the, the large green area is, is waiting for external web services. And uh, I don't know if you can read the bottom text, but basically on any, on any given Monday, we have like 100 and 150 Apache processes uh, standing around uh, and using 16 giga gigabytes of memory. And most of the time, they're actually just twiddling their thumbs. Like a third of the time, they're actually not being used because they're waiting for something else to happen. And that's, you know, that's a huge waste of resources. Anyone could, could tell you that. And, and it, the picture is about the same if you look at the CPU. We're not really using the resources we have to. Uh, and conversely, to run the site, we have to use a humongous server uh, to have all the RAM we need for, for doing this. Shared nothing. Um, that's, that's the PHP uh, way of doing things. It's like your, your server is completely retarded. Everything, every time you ask it, uh, ask it a question, it's like, uh, give me a page two of the front page. It starts all over again asking, hey, who are you? Where are you coming from? Uh, 
what's the site name I'm on? Uh, what database am I supposed to talk to? Okay, let me go talk to that database. And all this happened every single time anything happens on the page. A whole lot of work. Um, and the, yes? Yeah, yeah, and that that can be a good thing. Um, yes? Are you trying to ask a question? No, she's just counting. Sorry. <laughs> uh, right. Well, yes, that is uh, that is not uh, specific to PHP, uh, but it is a problem of the way PHP works, um, and it's it's many in many ways a good thing because you don't have to wor worry when writing PHP programs about memory leaking or anything like that because whenever your uh, request is done, the PHP uh, Apache server throws everything you've done away. All the hard work you had of uh, asking the database for something or whatever you've done, it's like, uh, it's like you know, uh, some offices, they have like shared desks. So every, ta every, every time you leave, you have to clean up all your stuff and put it in your bag and go away. It's a bit like that. Um, it's a very simple model, but it also brings a lot of overhead. Um, and the reason it was made this way was that PHP was originally not intended to have all that much going on on, one, on a single page. So you didn't need to keep all sorts of state and logic around. But when you're building something like a chat service, you actually need to have a, a lot of stored state about uh, what, what your, your, your news what users are online and uh, where where they are in the queue and um, you know what's going on and what chat messages are waiting for someone else to pick them up and and for all that you have to you know stick stuff in the database and get it back out again and uh, at, at the chat side in example it was peaking around uh, 1400 uh, MySQL queries a second uh, when we had like a, a a, a normal evening with homework uh, help. And that's about the, 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 the pain point for MySQL. It's, it's hard to scale it much further than that without, uh, you know. And at the same time, we were actually getting complaints that this, the updates were slow because we were only polling back to the, to the PHP server every five seconds to see whether <laughs> there were any, any new messages. So you actually, if someone wrote to you, you could, it, it could take up to five seconds before you actually saw what they wrote to you. And, and when you're chatting, that's, that's, that can be kind of inconvenient. And, they, and of course, if we decreased our po uh, the polling time, we would just increase the server load. So that wasn't really a, a good way to go. Um, and PHP was never designed for this. Um, some of one of the the more exciting new developments that's been on the web is something called web sockets uh, where your browser makes a persistent connection to the server and and uh, the server can then send stuff back to your client without ha your client having to ask it again uh, anyone who's who's built uh, anything like a chat service in PHP knows that you have to continually ask the server hey what's going on hey what's going on hey hey what's going on but with web sockets, you can actually do it the other way around and actually just you know, open a socket and wait for the server to tell you, hey, something new has happened. Um, I think that, that's, that stands to reason that, that that is much more efficient. It's like you, you know, taking a drive with, with your car and having your, your kids screaming uh, all the while in the back, hey, are we, are we, are we ye there yet? And it's actually very rare for you to answer yes to that question. So it, it wouldn't it be nice if you could just uh, make the, the kids be quiet and then just tell them when you're, when you're there. That basically is what we're doing with WebSockets. Right. Another point uh, in favor of, of doing stuff with Node.js, and this is very specific for Node.js because Node.js is written in JavaScript. So imagine... Uh, any one of you has, has probably de dealt with having a form on a website and having to validate the input to that form. Um, and as we are g getting more and more dynamic and Ajaxy and stuff like that, 
you actually need to have validation on the client because it's annoying to have to, to fill out the whole form and click submit and wait just to have it tell you back, hey, you did, you missed this field, or you know the address must contain a number, or whatever, whatever. Uh, so more and more we are starting to implement validation on the clients, but we actually still need validation on the server because when you're doing your validation in JavaScript, uh, anyone with uh, just a little bit of knowledge about JavaScript can actually cheat that. So you want your validation to run both on the server and the client. And with Node.js, you can actually do that. You can use the same exact code on both sides, uh, and, and everything just works as, as it's supposed to be. And you can do, the re do this with all, the, all your business logic, basically. Uh, so it's also, uh, uh, when you are having uh, you know, performance problems, you can look into, uh, you know, look into what, what kind of work your server is doing. And if, you know, if you're doing a lot of string parsing, or uh, you know, juggling XML or whatever, you can actually push some of that work to the client and say, and you know, send some more raw da da data back to the client and make make the client do all the hard work for you. You know, that that's actually free uh, free resources uh, in your server center, right there. So that that can be pretty sneaky. There are. Um, and that's that's all very nice, you know. Uh, but but how do you get get it to talk talk to Drupal? You know, having just a separate you know server Abbey thingy is not really all that helpful. Um, so we've we've actually helped uh, build some tools tools for that. Um, the simple way, of course, is is to you know just communicate with uh, with a Node.js server via the REST protocol. Um, that that use case is uh, is actually also kind of common. Uh, imagine you have like a third-party web service that you are need your site to integrate with. You, know, you need to provide some data from a third-party source. Um, so you can actually just load that over to Node and, and make Node do all the hard work with that because PHP really has a lot of ho overhead uh, for doing stuff like that. Imagine if you're just uh, you're just taking the incoming parameters from the client side and passing them on to a server somewhere else. And if you do that with, with, within Drupal, you'll actually have like uh, 300 milliseconds of, of Drupal starting up and uh, a lot of waiting while the, the web server responds and a lot of, you know, and it's all using memory at the same time. So that's that's the... Yeah, that's the, the more or less the same case as, as uh, in the beginning I, I explained, using your resources more efficiently. But if you want uh, your Node installation to actually interact with Drupal, you need some way of, of actually checking that the user uh, you're looking at is actually the one. Uh, I don't know, can you read this? More or less. Well, the, the gist of it is that we've uh, we've made it a, a Node.js module that actually is able to interact with some parts of the Drupal database, uh, mostly the simple parts. Uh, we don't get into you know uh, fields and uh, content types and stuff like that. But looking at users and permissions, uh, in our experience, actually gets us what we need because. Most of the time, we're just interested in finding out who is the user, and is he allowed to do whatever it is that uh, wha that we're actually doing on this page. And this is some example code that just that does just that. Um, if you want, I can dig into the the Node uh, JS module for Drupal in a bit a bit later. And a demo of that. My code. Uh, yeah. Well, basically, you can see the website here. Oh. Just a moment.
passwords, a great thing. This is not very exciting uh, in many ways, but, but the thing you can actually see behind the scenes, if we look what's going on, down here, it contacts our Node.js instance. And here uh, we have our Drupal session ID. <coughs> um, and that is, that is actually used to, to authenticate the user. And because I, uh, in this, uh, go away. No. <laughs> 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 Lots of fun. Um, because in this instance I'm logged in as an admin user, I get this interface that you can see here. Uh, that's a list of, of helpers online and a list of, of users uh, waiting for help. Um, this is actually not very exciting without uh, without any actual users users online. But that's the basic gist of it. And and we have the same code here. Yeah, down basically here, we use the is admin flag to grant the user more permissions, and this is this is the node code that actually runs this site. A more complex example is actually a, a product we've been working on the in the last uh, few months. Basically, it's a it, it's a DNS control panel uh, powered by Drupal, and imagine um, let's bring up the, the network control panel so we can see what's actually going on here. And you can see this is this is not a this is not a joke. We are not uh, we're not fooling you or anything here. This is actually the, the actual response time of our Node.js servers uh, from this very location. We're going out on the internet to a server here in Germany and asking for something and actually getting a response back in forty three milliseconds. That's more or less, uh, you know, ten times less than we would uh, that it would t have taken if we were using it inside Drupal. That's the main, uh, you know, the main uh, interesting point about it actually. And let's try something a bit fun here. MX TXT. <laughs> oh, save changes. And you can see consistently across these these requests to our API server, which is running Node.js, they all take like less than 100, 100 milliseconds. And the, the, ma the main, uh, the most of that time is actually talking to the database itself. And you know that that's uh, that's beyond the scope of this demonstration. Uh, tuning, tuning that, and you can see um, uh, oh yeah, wrong domain. <laughs> Fun like that. Uh, any moment now. The internet here is a bit flaky, uh, but you can see actually. The few actions I just just did then uh, did in there are updated real time across our network of DNS servers, and all, and all this is actually powered by Node.js. Um, Node.js is is really powerful for doing all sorts of of small small simple tasks. Uh, we have like uh, three or four different Node.js uh, apps. One that handles syncing to the web servers. Uh, one that, that handles rendering the zone files and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so that's that's uh, well. We're, a, we're I'm very excited about you know being able to provide my users with an interface that's so responsive that you don't actually have to wait. You know, if you can get beyond, get below like 200 milliseconds. It'll feel instant to your users. Another exciting thing um, that we actually haven't done much in practice uh, is what they call RPC. Um, 
you might uh, think that is a very nasty word. <laughs> and some RPC systems uh, in the past have actually been really nasty and complex. Uh, but when doing RPC with Node, you're basically just creating a small server that is prepared to you know, provide some, some functions you can call from the other side. So if uh, in this case we are creating a transform function uh, that you know replaces all the vowels with a double O, um, I don't know for, for what purpose it's, but, <laughs> but you can imagine doing something uh, on your server that is a lot more complex than this and you wanting, you're wanting to expose that to another server because doing it this way will actually save you from having to write uh, an API uh, on the one side and having to write a client on the other side. So this is as a, way, a way of sidestepping all, all that hard work. And you can see the results of uh, doing it in P, uh, calling the same uh, function in PHP. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, you just connect to the, uh, in this case we're using a library called dnode, uh, and it has language bindings available for uh, uh, besides its na native Node.js, it has uh, bindings available for Python and PHP and Ruby and Java, I think, and other obscure languages. And that, that actually means that you can build some functionality on, on one uh, thing and, and ha have other machines using it without having to make a, do a whole lot of work uh, around it, basically. And you can pass errors back, and it's, it's uh, when you... Uh, it, you might not have, have done all that much of, of this kind of stuff, but when you have like five servers that need to do something together in concert, this is actually pretty powerful because it goes both ways. Uh, so when you're, when PHP connects to, uh, to the dnode server, the dnode server can actually uh, call back to the PHP server and tell it, hey, what's going on? Uh, you know, I just updated the, the whatever record. So for distributed systems, this is awesome. Um, still see how much time I have left. There are other implementations of this kind of uh, this kind of thing. Um, in the example I showed you before, uh, we are actually using something called Now.js. Um, which is a precursor to what is now called Bridge. And you can see the basic logic of, of all this stuff is here we are assigning, uh, we have a, you know, uh, this needs to be larger, I can see that. Hmm. You can see we, we are creating groups uh, we can assign users to. And then we're saying that everyone in that, that group has the function clear queue available. Um, I don't know if you noticed before. Uh, this, is, this, this button, it says clear queue in Danish. Uh, so we, we, with a little bit of JavaScript on the front end, we have wired up uh, this function to this button. And the, this function is running on the server. And it cleans out, you know, the database table and, and the state we have about who's in who's in line for for help. And and that is really a, a powerful way of doing stuff like that. Um, more or less, yeah. That is basically the the gist of it. Um, I've put aside a lot of time for questions because I think this is a really interesting subject. And uh, if, uh, if you want, I can dig into more or more examples of, of how to, to do simple stuff with, no, with Node.js. Anyone? Yes? Yeah, that could be, uh, 
you know, anything where you're doing, uh, well, I should repeat the question, uh, that's right. Uh, your question was that uh, if you have like a web app uh, where you have like a continually scrolling content, like on Twitter, uh, where you scroll down and more content appears, uh, if, if Node.js would, would be a good way to, to fetch that content. And yes, I think almost any, uh, any, uh, any place on your website where you're doing something simple via JavaScript or Ajax, uh, to call back that to do something that simply fetches stuff from the database and returns it back as JSON or whatever is a really good candidate for replacing stuff with Node.js because doing so in, in PHP is, is really inefficient. Yes? Uh, well, it is closer, uh, I'd say, but, but it, it depends heavily on, on your use case, of course. Uh, but but in, the co in the case with the, our chat system, we really needed to get to do at least four or five queries to determine uh, who is this user, uh, does he have access to this page, uh, what messages are waiting for him, uh, what is his spot in the queue, uh, is he actually banned from the system, um, and those, you know, those queries need to happen no matter if you have the Drupal bootstrap or not. Uh, but, but you can keep that state around if you have like a uh, user persistent connection like a WebSocket. You can just attach uh, that, that info to that so you don't have to do the lookup for every little thing that happens. Yes? Well, um, that, that's of course true. Uh, well, your your argument is that that Node.js is mainly faster because it has to do less work, and that is that is completely true. Uh, um, and but the, the many of the ways Node.js has to do less work is actually not not really possible to do if if you want to work inside Drupal. Um, and the example I showed from our own web app. Uh, we're actually not just, you know, transforming a string. We are actually doing a couple of lookups, uh, several lookups in the database and updating a table and, you know, uh, formatting the data that is respons res sent back to the user. Uh, but yeah, it, that's true. Uh, JavaScript, the Node.js runtime is a bit faster than PHP's uh, simply because Google, the Google engineers that, that are working on V8 has spent so incredibly much time <laughs> tuning and tweaking and doing all sorts of magic stuff uh, on the runtime. Yes? Yes, the question was, aren't we missing all the hooks? Yes. Uh, this is not something you can build a module of. Um, uh, this is, uh, well, you can build extensible stuff in Node.js, but, but doing so is very much different than you would do it in, in, in Drupal. So you wouldn't use hooks or anything like that. Uh, so this is mainly for, you know, the, the, the end line scenario. I need to build something, a finished thing. Uh, you, it's hard. There is actually a, a, a Node.js module for Drupal. Um, it's not, I, I didn't write it myself, so I, I, I won't say too much about it because whatever I'm saying might easily be wrong. Uh, but the basic thing they're doing with that module is that they're, they're providing a way for, for your PHP code to push notifications to any user who's online on the Drupal site. And for that, uh, they have a, a separate Node.js uh, Node application uh, that listens for connections from Drupal and passes those messages down uh, down to the clients. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, what are the types of tasks uh, that you want to implement uh, using Node.js? Uh, what are the typical uh, use cases where you can where, where you would recommend using uh, Node.js? Uh, you mentioned, for example, uh, cleaning up database pages and so on. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Well, the, the main point is actually what you call stateful interaction. Uh, like you're connected to a chat room, you're talking to Michael. Uh, you just need to know uh, what, what's changed since I was last here but you need to keep all that state of what's going on at the moment in memory so you don't have to you know look up into the database uh, and and an another thing is you know actually m much of what drupal does is just acting like a proxy for the for the database you know fetching stuff from the database and it's just slightly transforming it transforming it and and sending it back and that's usually what you're doing if you're d building an uh, an ajax powered interface Yes? Uh, so this might be a tricky question to answer, but I'm thinking in terms of the learning curve and the time to implement. Um, if one needed to set up uh, the infrastructure to run those devs and, uh, I don't know, just a simple query that gets results from a database and sends it back to the application, what kind of time and effort are we talking about here? Well, it depends a bit on how, or how comfortable you are with JavaScript in the first place. Um, if you if you've worked a, l a little bit with JavaScript, you know that that everything is is it's a bit different. Uh, it's more like function oriented programming, and you and you have like callbacks uh, that get back to you later. It's a bit like when you're calling a, an AJAX request uh, in the, in your front end JavaScript code. You have to you know you get a function that is called later when the response is, is ready, and that's how almost everything happens in Node.js. You know. If you call your database, uh, you pass a function along, and uh, when the database responds is back, that function is called. So it's it. Uh, so Node.js code main looks more like uh, like this, uh, where we have deeply wrapped uh, stuff. Uh, well, this is actually not a very good example. Um, Like, li like this, you have functions wrapped in functions, wrapped in functions, um, because they're called at, at different times uh, throughout the, the execution. Uh, this is actually some testing code we've, we've written for, for the DNS service, but, but that, that's the basic gist of it. Um, on top of that, you have to, you know, uh, setting up Node.js on a web server is, is really not all that complex. Um, you can uh, Node.js runs as its own process, and you can either, you know, uh, use uh, Apache's uh, pro mod proxy or nginx proxy support uh, to have it on the same IP address as your main website, or you could use it. Uh, you can run it on its own IP address or a different port number. Um, but it it runs as a standalone web server, uh, and you just have to to keep that running as long as the Drupal a a application is running. Um, and getting getting to learn all that, I think, depending on what what you need to do, but but it's uh, you know the hello world of Drupal, uh, no Node.js is actually uh, starting a server. Uh, here it is. <laughs> this is how much code you need to to <laughs> to make your own web server web service with Node.js. <laughs> so. The simple stuff you can learn in, in a day or two, I would say. Uh, yes, uh, you. Is, is there any security issues that could be offered by AWS uh, Um Well, uh, in to the extent that you're actually accessing Drupal's database uh, from within Node.js, you have to take the same precautions as you do in Drupal. You know, use parameterized queries and. Uh, you know, uh, check who the user is before you know uh, allowing him, allowing him to change roles of Drupal users, or you know. Uh, but there's, I don't think uh, there's anything surprising uh, security-wise. Uh, Yeah, if you want, if you want to, your queries to to do any support any any of the, the stuff that happens in Drupal with hook query alter, 
you would have to do that manually yourself. Yes? Yeah, I think um, in this instance, we're actually not using Backbone. We're using uh, something sim uh, a, a different framework called Ember.js. Yeah. Um, and, and the Drupal, for this application, Drupal is simply a shell uh, that we use to, you know, we load a bit of markup and all the magic, all the data pulling uh, is actually happens through the node instance. Um, so, so there aren't really two streams here. Uh, Drupal is mainly passive. It, it just helps load this page, helps authenticate the user, helps us check access, you know, for, for does who owns this stuff. Uh, you know, for a system like this, it's pretty important that the users can change is each other's data and can, can only see the data that they own themselves. So that's, that's, that's why we use Drupal for this. Down there? Um, it depends a bit on what, what kind of load, load balancer you, uh, well, the question was, uh, persistent connections to Node.js, is that uh, troublesome with a load balancer? And uh, it depends heavily on, on if, your node, uh, if your load balancer actually supports it. Uh, we've used it uh, with a simple varnish, uh, varnish load balancing, and that, uh, that works great because when when one is detects that it doesn't support whatever magic is going on in the HTTP transaction that is going on, for example, when you do a web circuit upgrade, one is just say, okay, uh, you guys talk to each other. I'll keep out of this, um, and it actually works as as, as expected. Um, but if you have some kind of some kind of old uh, old system or anything like that, yeah, well. It, it depends, but uh, the thing is, with, when we are using uh, for uh, for the uh, for the chat side, um, we are actually using something called Socket.io, uh, which is the library you can use for Node.js that handles um, fallbacks uh, for these things, uh, because not all browsers actually support WebSocket yet. Uh, and and if you're behind a proxy at home or whatever, if you're sitting at your school or anything, you might not be able to get web sockets going uh, at all, actually. Uh, so, so this library actually helps us fall back on, uh, on different stuff. Uh, it, it can use flash, uh, flash sockets, uh, you know, the, the flash uh, with the, you know, all the nasty graphics you see on the website that jumps around. It, it can actually be used for something useful, and that is for uh, for providing fallback support for web sockets because Flash, uh, in the Flash runtime, is something similar to web sockets. Um, and if you use a library like socket.io, it helps you fall back on that. And if all else fails, it'll use um, Ajax polling, so it, it'll just pull the server every few seconds. And and then you're, you, you know, then we're back to, to how it used to work with this site. Uh, but we are still not back to the awful performance of the old site because Node.js, uh, when it when you use polling for that, it still has the state in memory when you poll, so it doesn't have to ask the database about e everything. It can just you know look up into an array and say, hmm, no, that's nothing new for you. Sorry. Anyone else? You? Uh, 
Um, well, the, the known module for Drupal. Right, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit confusing. <laughs> Uh, well, we've we've in uh, yeah right. We've implemented some parts of the Drupal API, uh, mainly uh, to do with uh, the DB, uh, you know, DB query uh, and user dot uh, whatever. Uh, this is kind of slow, but basically we provide we provide uh, similar functions to like uh, user access in Drupal. Uh, so you can call, if you have a user object loaded from the, the Drupal database in Node.js, you can actually call user access on it to find out uh, does this user ha has, uh, have a specific Drupal permission. Uh, and similar, you can call user load to load the, load the user and uh, yeah, stuff like that, basically. Uh, if we use a node library uh, to connect with the Drupal database, yes, um, depending on the database, we use a node library called MySQL um, for connecting to MySQL database or a node library called P PG for connecting to PostgreSQL databases. It doesn't support all the, the new magic in, in Drupal 7 with query building and stuff like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a very simple uh, query syntax. Uh, let me see if I can actually find it here. Modules, Drupal. See, this is some of the code. This is user load, and it it simply you know selects selects the role from the from the Drupal database and adds adds the roles uh, the specific user has and makes a callback. Yes. Um, what are the differences between Bridge and Dnode? Um, well, I think um, the main the main difference is that they're just competing products. Uh, you know, what are the differences between Typo three and and uh, Drupal? They're more or less you know the same same th kind of things, but they have different designs d design decisions. Um, f Bridge tries to do a bit more, uh, but is it's a little harder to to understand what is going on because it's it's more magic, in a way, um, and but but you can do more or less the same thing with both. So you use both of them. Uh, well, yeah, um, yeah. The reason we we're considering switching away f from Bridge uh, or on or now JS as it used to be called is mainly that it's uh, it's run by a startup. Um, and there are no other developers on the code, so we are a bit, uh, you know, careful about that because you never know when they might actually go away. Down there. The question was, uh, how do we keep our Node.js servers running even th if there is an error or it crashes or something? Um, it depends a bit on what operating system you're using, but almost, uh, if you're using Ubuntu, you can use uh, something called Upstart. Uh, that is a system for keeping track of what services your system is running and restarting them if they fail. Um, we using we use something called supervisor which is a python program which does the same thing it monitors processes and restarts them uh, if they are crashed um, there i think there are hundreds of, of, of small scripts like that um, so you can use whatever you wish more or less there's also a node.js powered one that is called forever uh, so if you want to run node you run your node script with another node script you can actually do do that Yes? Is it uh, running multi threaded or is it calling these processes by batches or how does it work? Uh, well, the question was uh, is Node.js running multi, multi threaded or uh, does it handle a process, uh, does it branch off processes like Apache? Um, and multi threaded, no. Uh, well, 
Well, yes. Uh, it's a bit complex, actually, because the Node.js program itself contains uh, several threads, uh, one which run JavaScript, and uh, a few others who handle stuff like uh, talking to the network and uh, reading files from disks. And so, in its, uh, so the Node.js program itself is, is multi-threaded, but you can't, or you really, or rather you shouldn't use uh, threads inside your uh, Node.js JavaScript code because JavaScript uh, is a dynamic language, so only one thread can actually run it uh, run the JavaScript environment at a time because otherwise your variables might change, uh, uh, you know, from one line to the next, and and that leads to really unpredictable code. Uh, so what you what you do if you want your uh, Node.js to take advantage of of all your uh, all the many CPUs on your servers, uh, you can either spawn you know four four copies of your Node.js program, and then they'll just you know share the share the resources available. Or if you need shared state between them, you can actually um, you can spawn you can spawn processes in Node.js like you can in Apache, um, and then you, you you are responsible for communicating between the processes yourself. Of course, that's it, actually one of the main use cases for Dnode. Uh, if you have several instances of the same program uh, that's running on the same server and you need them to tr you need to tr them to talk to each other. Uh, you can use Dnode for that. Yes, down there? Um, well, if I understand your question correctly, uh, if you have like a single pay, single resources resource that is being requested by ten time ten thousand users at one time, uh, how is Node.js going to handle that? And um, no, it's not going to take the same. Well, it has to respond to each each of the ten ten thousand requests in turn. Uh, but uh, depending on what what code you're actually running uh, to generate that response, uh, it'll do one of several different different things. As soon as you do a database call or anything asynchronous in Node.js, it'll use the opportunity uh, while it's waiting for something else to happen. It'll take another request, uh, incoming request, and answer that if it can. Uh, so if you have like an example like the whole hello world uh, we had uh, where was it uh, like this well then uh, this will take a picosecond or something like that for the node.js server to actually process th this part of the code um, for this case most of the time is spent actually passing the http request and uh, putting together the right packages on the network and stuff like that and that actually handle uh, is is run on threads um, so uh, well it's 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 kind of hard to answer uh, give a, a, a short answer to this um, but node.js will handle a lot of concurrent connections and it won't take 43 milliseconds to answer each of them 43 milliseconds, the most of that time is actually spent on the network going back and forth and going back and forth with the database. So it might take one millisecond per request. So if you have 10,000 requests, it might take you know 10 seconds to respond to all of them. Uh, but it might easily be shorter than that. You'd, you'd have to run a benchmark to <laughs> get some, get a decent answer to that, I think. Anyone else down there? Yeah. How, how are you doing that? Um, well, there are uh, a metric ton of Redis clients for, for Node.js. Uh, the Node.js community is really excited about Redis. Um, so use, uh, I don't really have a recommendation of which one is good, uh, but use any of the Redis clients and 
you know, you just give it the IP address and the number, and then it has, in JavaScript, it provides uh, the methods that you can use on, on your Redis server to run, in, run them there simply. How are you using that in your application? Um, they're telling me to sh shut up. <laughs> well, uh, to simply answer uh, how we're using that in our application, we can use it for storing, um, storing uh, Drupal sessions and stuff like that. Uh, any kind of data so you need to keep, keep in sync between uh, multiple servers, Redis can be a really good solution for that. So yeah. Um, aren't we supposed to finish at quarter past? So we have five five more minutes if anyone uh, where do you host the notification? Um, we have our own web server. Um, so we we run it there. Uh, currently we are renting it from Hetzner, uh, which is actually a German company. Uh, but any VPS or kind almost any kind of server <laughs> will run Node.js. We actually use Nginx for all our applications, uh, but most of the time we try to uh, either put Node.js on a, on a different port number so it doesn't have to be proxied uh, via Nginx or run it on a different IP address. That's actually what we're doing with our application here. Um, you can see the, the requests to Node.js goes to api.afd42.com. Uh, which is a different IP address. Um, so in this case, we're not proxying. Anyone else? Well, um, thank you for coming. from uh, New Relic, actually. actually something pretty cool uh, called Node Inspector that allows you to run the, basically this, this inspector, um, the same as runs in, in the Chrome browser. You can run that on your Node.js program and uh, insert breakpoints and inspect variables and do all the stuff that this, this uh, tool can do. That's pretty neat, actually. Um, so I think you should prep, probably look into that. It's called Node Inspector, and there's some and pretty good ex instruction on how, how to get it working. If you hear for, from disconnect between server and client, can that be something with a misconfig to Nginx in between, or where should I look for? Well, it, it depends, you know. We've, we've seen some really strange issues, you know, use, uh, like people using mobile phones and switching cell towers, and there can be all sorts of, of weird reasons why you, you're seeing disconnects. So it's hard to give a general answer for it, but a misconfigured proxy could do it easily, of course. Uh, Node.js uh, or NDNX proxy will not work if you're trying to do uh, stuff with web sockets, for example. It doesn't support that yet. Yeah. This kind of really helps start to grow a um, web application. It's a very difficult thing to actually run. So yeah. I run about it. Um, most of the data actually going up to uh, Google Pages where the customers are using the table anyway. Yeah, that's what we're doing with our app too. Yeah. Try and figure it 
Yeah, I, d I don't think there's actually much, uh, you know, much, much to learn there. Uh, it's basically, you know, changing the URL of your AJAX request to point to the other server. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, let me demonstrate. Yeah, yeah, basically we, we're doing it, it in JavaScript. Yeah. Um, you can see on, uh, on this, on our application here. Uh, so kind of having that mix of, you know, stuff 